Hello, everybody. A warm welcome to all of you who are in the room in real life. Analog, we can see each other. We are three dimensional. It's amazing after two years on flat screens. And hello to all of you out there looking at us, looking at me right now from wherever you are across Europe and abroad and following this Culture for Health Roundtable and Policy Workshop. The roundtable that we have today has gathered a number of experts that will both give us an introduction to issues around management and treatment in culture and health interventions. It will be a session where it will be quite important that we all participate. The roundtable is not just for us to lean back and enjoy the clever words of the experts. But since we're all experts, we also have to reflect together and to give our contributions together. So uh, later on, I will start by giving you a mentee, but I will, won't do that right now. And then I will ask you to participate, to give us your words, your reflections, so that we can all then have a good material to choose from when we get into workshops later on and we start our discussions on the different challenges that we are facing. But first out, and, and just to, to give it to our online presenters and to you who are sitting here next to me, uh, I'm somewhat of a time fascist, so the time you've been aligned is the time you have. Um, so don't, don't try to cross me too much because I might get angry. Uh, so first out is the Danish member of pa European Parliament, Mrs. Penilla Weiss. And Penilla, you and are more. Than... Anyway. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry. Hello, Penilla. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, and... you. Uh, I can hear you now. You were just uh, away for 10 seconds after I unmuted myself. I don't know why. Hello to everybody. Hello. Hi. Can you also see me? Give me a signal when, yeah. Um, okay, I hope it works. Uh, at the moment, I am entering uh, a museum in uh, in Paris. That's my conditions for the moment. Uh, yes, I will take this off here. Okay, thank you so much. I am so delighted to be with, together with you this uh, noon uh, for this very, very important uh, uh, round table. Uh, I hope it will be a success and I excuse very much for not being uh, in my own country, Denmark, to be able to sit down together with you, uh, creating uh, also uh, a physical round table, uh, uh, making comments and also informal talks with uh, many of you that I have very much looking, been looking forward to at least listen to when I have finished my very brief uh, saying hello to all of you. Uh, as many of you might know, uh, at least uh, uh, my my fellow Danes is that I started my career. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, I started my career as uh, as a nurse, and I worked for twelve years in the uh, in the architectural uh, industry, uh, working with how uh, the physical environment impacts our. Sorry. Uh, okay, and then I stay here. I find you. Can't, sorry, it's a very very. Oh yeah, I can do it here. Thank you. Sorry for the, uh, the troubles that is being made here, being online. It's okay. It's okay. Um, no, uh, sorry for um, the confusion uh, around me. I just wanted to say hello, and I very much hope that Nils, you and I can have a talk after today about all the contributions that are important for me as a member of the European Parliament to know about and also to work with because as some of you might know besides from the fact that i once was a nurse and i worked about in architecture working with the, uh, the physical environment uh, and and how it impacts uh, the health uh, both of patients of course but also the impact on uh, families uh, dealing with health issues and of course also the many uh, professionals working around uh, in social and healthcare sectors i would like to know specifically what input you like for the European Union to give back, uh, to facilitate, to also direct funding for, in order for the European Union to be more resilient uh, in the way that we 
focus on health uh, that introduces also a new and, and more modern understanding that health is not only a matter of, of, of diagnoses and medicine, it's about how to create a work-life balance in terms of the respect for the fact that we become older and older as Europeans because we are pretty good at having a healthy lifestyle compared to a lot of other uh, places around the world, but also that we have uh, intense research going on in how to prevent uh, illnesses, to uh, uh, make people disabled from uh, taking part in, in, in a normal life society, that if we can do that even better uh, by understanding that health is also it's 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 a part of our culture it's it's the way we deal with health is also a message of uh, how we understand our own culture so understanding our own culture even better makes it it us more strong in how to navigate in the terms of yes we are getting older and older uh, we live longer and also we have more diagnoses during a, a long time of, of living and comorbidity is a part of, of the modern life also in the future that we need to be able to navigate in that. That is some of the uh, special interests that I have being member of the uh, health uh, committee in the European Parliament, but also being a member of the industry and research committee. Uh, there we have the possibility to direct funding, uh, also to put notes on the, the specific budgets and funding in a way where we combine uh, what we can do to, to be more resi health resilient in the Union, also in the framework of the newly adopted strategy from the European Parliament on, on healthcare, but also the upcoming files on the EU de 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 health data space, that what we know about uh, health, we can even systematize that knowledge even better also in a way where new products new solutions um, new business uh, innovations in between uh, healthcare uh, and societal uh, issues linked to uh, to to our culture um, that is something that i also would like uh, to see developed from this round table today and namely to have more ideas on the table on on also how to, we can boost the European economy and our resilience, making entrepreneurship into healthcare, something that more young people do. Uh, either they come with a healthcare professional background or they come from the STEM uh, educations uh, because we need this cross-disciplinary approach uh, to health also that uh, covers the, both the digital aspects to the more, uh, uh, traditional caring uh, uh, and, and health-related professions. I'm so, so sorry about the confusion around me at the moment. I'm at a conference in Paris and right now my group is moving from A to B. And that was why I was speaking while going through security uh, in a very French building, not to offend any French in the round table. But also I would just like to wrap up now saying thank you so much for uh, at least although invite me to the talk uh, today. I will not be visible, but I will listen for the next hour. At, at, or, and if you want uh, to, uh, to give me a message or a question, I'm still uh, by your side. And also I look very much forward to continue my conversation with you, Nils, but of course also with you, dear colleague Alexis, uh, from the other side of the political spectrum of the European Parliament. Uh, I look forward that maybe we can too can have a cup of coffee and make a kind of an informal wrap up of what we can do uh, as, uh, as two representatives of the European Parliament working together for more understanding of the valuable linkages that there are truly between culture and the health resilience of the Union. Thank you so much and best of luck for the whole afternoon of this uh, event. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much for that. <clears throat> and, and obviously, I will be more than happy to continue the conversation. And thank you for giving us that prism that
culture for health also implicates that health is part of our cultural self-perception and the way that we design our societies. And that could be quite important for us to keep as a kind of reflector or a backdrop when we comment on Mentimeter and when we go into our group discussions later on. And, and may I drop just one note? I forgot, Nils, because I just talked with a colleague uh, uh, half an hour ago on the upcoming report in the European Parliament of the European Bauhaus. You know, this initiative of how can we, through uh, a rejuvenizing of the Bauhaus concept in Europe, how can we also, uh, besides creating more businesses, also create a more healthy uh, lifestyle understanding of how we live as Europeans. And there will be a deadline within the next three, four weeks to amend this proposal for European Bauhaus. So if anybody in the round table this afternoon comes up with some ideas that might fit into uh, the physical environment and the uh, European Bauhaus as something that is not only meant to be a handbook for architects, but in, especially also for us who uses the physical environment, but also for the interior, et cetera, et cetera. So just it's a little deadline to be aware about the next uh, three, four weeks. And if you would like to contribute uh, uh, on that work, you can uh, all very welcome to send me an email from the Parliament's website, especially on Bauhaus. Thank you. Thank you very much. With that, remembering that we have a deadline that might be interesting for us, I would like to give the word to our next speaker, who is representing the European Commission. It's an old friend of mine, actually. Monica Urian, please, you're more than welcome to join me up here. And I would like you to make a choice whether you would like to speak into this microphone or have it in your hand. Knowing you, I think it's gonna be this choice. Thank you, Nils. And it is a pleasure to see old friends and new ones. Um... Not really. Okay, a more classical approach. <laughs> Sorry about that. So yes, it's a great pleasure to, to be with you today. Um, and thank you so much to the Central Denmark region to, to, for hosting us. Um, I was thinking that it's the second time uh, I'm uh, actually on mission. We call this a mission in the European Commission in two years. So it's a very special moment to see real people and actually to, to talk to experts who um, can, can, um, with whom I can learn so much because you know we need inspiration uh, also in the European institutions. We are actually uh, open to, to exchange. Um, and if I speak about my Director General Education and Culture, it's really the Director General where you, we are all the time in, in contact with, with the civil society. And uh, in my case, because I work on, in cultural policy with, with the cultural sector. Um, I had prepared two visuals, and we can start with the first one. Uh, I thought that images are stronger than words, and because I'm a very visual person, uh, when I started to research on this, it was in full uh, COVID time, on, on this topic of arts, uh, health, and, and culture. And, um, and I came across this uh, photo uh, of a Danish uh, a very young talent. Um, who actually received the World Press Photo of the Year um, in 2021, so last year. And it, you, you can see, uh, it happens actually in Brazil. It's a scene uh, where uh, Rosa, this, this old lady, receives a hug from her caretaker uh, through a plastic curtain. This was a, a, an invention uh, that they needed in order to have some, some physical contact after months of isolation. Thanks. So does it work? No? Okay, and, um, and for me, it was really a symbol of, of not only what uh, arts and culture can do for health, but also what they can say about health. And it was uh, like a, a witness to the more humane uh, healthcare system that we are, to which we are aiming to, to participate in as culture sector. Um, and then if you can go to the next image, um, this is a picture that I took from, uh, that I found on Twitter yesterday in my long train trip from, from uh, Copenhagen. And it comes from, uh, from a, a child in Ukraine uh, who is um, representing here the human shield 
uh, defending one of the Ukrainian cities in Kherson. And I was reflecting that between these two uh, collective traumas, we, we have a big responsibility really as, as Europeans, but also as, um, as, as human beings and as professionals to, to do everything that we can in order to uh, help our societies heal. And this is to ask, to, to reply to the reason why, I think this is why I'm here today. Um, and this is why um, we are also very grateful in the DG Education and Culture that the European Parliament has um, al allocated this um, a budget for the um, uh, project uh, for which we are meeting today, which is uh, called the preparatory action. So we are preparing something um, for a bottom up policy development in to link culture, health, and well being. And it, it, it's a premiere for us to work on these topics uh, in such a, a structured way. Um, of course, you may know that we, we let's say, uh, see both culture and health as human rights, at least this is my perspective here. So both access to culture and healthcare are human rights. And of course, both um, culture, cultural heritage, um, collab cooperation between member states in culture, and access to health and uh, the, uh, is, are, they are in the European Union treaties on the Lisbon treaties, but they are not connected. So I think there was, um, uh, there is a lot of work to be done uh, in terms of policy development to connect uh, this, um, these two notions and to work with a lot of uh, European Union institutions. Um, and for that, we, we really appreciate to continue working with the European Parliament, of course, because as I said, they are the start of this um, project. However, we, we started already in 2018. Uh, if you know a bit about European culture policy, uh, you would know that there is a blueprint, like an overall strategy uh, for the European Union, which is called the New European Agenda for Culture. And one of the pillars uh, was precisely um, the social pillar and particularly social cohesion and well-being. So let's say we were a bit visionary in that way, at least at, at the very um, uh, high level policy making. Um, and we also said in that document that cities and regions are at the forefront of experimentation. So this is why really we need uh, to have contact with, with, um, uh, with um, regions like the region where we are now and with, with cities who implement a lot of pilot projects and they, they can teach us what works, what doesn't work and how to go forward. Um, you may know that the, the European Union doesn't have a, a specific um, competence on culture, but we work a lot with the member states. And from this point of view, um, the, the Council of the European Union also decided to work on uh, social cohesion and uh, well-being. And we had, for example, a lot of experts, um, expert work on architecture, which, which uh, Mrs. Weiss has just mentioned working on quality architecture and it's of course very much connected not only to uh, infrastructure but also a way of thinking about space including public space uh, it's a report that i, I um, encourage you to to read it's publicly available and also we had um, a workshop on this same um, topic um, uh, culture health and well-being which we organized for the member states um, last year online unfortunately uh, and we have also a report publicly available for that uh, so we already started in, uh, talking to uh, cultural uh, organizations and getting inspiration for this work. Um, and the member states were very interested in this topic. Now we, you may know that we, they are negotiating the next uh, work plan for culture for 2023, 26. And, um, and we hope this, um, this theme will keep uh, being um, in, this, in the picture. Maybe two words about one. challenges. What I see in the future is a huge, huge field of work. Um, so of course we are just, despite everything, we are just in the beginning. In the Creative Europe program, in the previous um, program from 2014-2020, uh, we, we already had some, some uh, European projects, cooperation projects on this topic. And I know that right now in this new Creative Europe program, 2021-27, uh, a lot of cultural cooperation projects and also cultural networks and cultural platforms are already working on culture and well-being uh, and health because it's it has been mainstreamed as one of the priorities. But we have to work with a lot more uh, other programs with regional um, uh, with the cohesion policy, so European regional development funds and others with recovery and resilience funds. All the COVID, uh, you know, the the funds. Um, unblocked by the European Commission to cope with, with COVID uh, recovery. 
and of course cooperation at the European health um, policy level and, and funds. Um, what to say, there is a lot of <laughs> um, sure. a lot of energy <laughs> to be spent in front of us, uh, but I really trust that with this project we can really touch at the same time, you know, the, the local and regional level and we can also uh, work to the talk to the national um, authorities to different ministries and we um, continue to support you at the European level. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much, Monica. Thank you very much. And thus giving us the perspective of, it's still following you now, thus giving us the perspective and the importance of the regional and the local level, I would like to go back to the, to the transnational level and give the word to our next speaker following us from, from Athens. Our next member of the European Parliament, Alexis Georgioulis, you're with us. I know you had a fantastic back screen as well. You're very welcome. Hello, everybody. Uh, how are you? Actually, I'm, um, I'm greeting you from, <coughs> sorry, uh, from Brussels because um, of the program, you know, it's um, kind of tied. So, um, first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me to uh, take part uh, in this um, very important uh, study uh, visit. Uh, I would love uh, to, uh, to be there with you, but uh, unfortunately, unfortunately the, um, the tight schedule of the European Parliament did not um, allow me to join you. Uh, next time I will be there, I promise. Uh, I would also like to congratulate you uh, for this uh, initiative, which is uh, very uh, innovative and also a crucial of crucial importance. Some may say um, that um, it is obvious how culture uh, benefits health, uh, benefits health and uh, well-being. Unfortunately, it's not that obvious to everyone, or it's not as obvious as it should be especially in uh, the eyes of uh, states and um, governments, because if the contribution uh, of culture to our well-being and uh, mental, uh, mental, mental health was uh, really measured and taken uh, under consideration, then uh, we, uh, there will be much more public funding, of course, and uh, support for culture. Uh, in the same line, I must say that uh, I found it at least uh, disappointing that many member states, including my country, did not uh, dedicate it to uh, percent for um, the culture uh, of the recovery and the resilience facility, as we strongly urged them uh, in our resolution of uh, September 2020. Obviously, uh, this is frustrating especially if we consider all the contribution that um, culture offered during the pandemic to every one of us who turned uh, to music, new, um, um, movies, uh, books, and overall cultural works to find comfort against the negativity the lockdowns uh, brought to us. Um, so for these reasons, I find this project of crucial importance because we have the chance now to prove the obvious link between culture and our well-being. I also um, I told you before uh, that um, I find this project innovative. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, innovative. Um, why is that? Let me explain, um, please, this um, a little bit. Uh, it is innovative uh, in the sense that um, updates deep ancient knowledge and puts it into practice in the nowadays uh, world. What I mean is that uh, in ancient Greece, it was common knowledge that culture is good for people's health, mental health, and well-being. Uh, this is why they would uh, build ancient uh, theaters, of course, next uh, to hospitals. Almost every ancient theater had um, a hospital nearby. And uh, if you'd ever go, to uh, the famous ancient uh, theater, Epidavrus, uh, you will be happily surprised to see the, um, uh, that next to Epidavrus theater is also built an ancient hospital called Asclepius. <laughs> Unfortunately, as an actor myself, uh, and also as a Greek and a great admirer 
of uh, the knowledge of the path of Greece. I could talk for hours um, about all the benefits and uh, culture may offer to humans, um, health, mental health and uh, well-being. But uh, I think uh, it's enough for now. Uh, so uh, I look forward to hearing uh, your inputs and um, uh, uh, the debate. And of course, uh, I would like to uh, accept the challenge of my colleague, uh, Mep uh, Berlin Weiss, um, that uh, we could gladly have a cup of coffee and explore our potential of collaboration to uh, support uh, culture for health. Thank you very much and looking forward to hearing from you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much, Alexis. Thank you. It's, it's, it's nice to know that roundtables already can lead to coffee dates in the political sphere because that's quite important actually. So thank you very much. Now we can go back to the people who are actually in the room and our next speaker is my name brother Nils Fitcher. Nils from the WHO. I would love you to come over here. <laughs> You're more than welcome to come over here. Which one? I think I'll, I'll uh, stick with You'll the, stick, uh, stick with with the stick. You'll stick with the stick. There you are. So I have five minutes. Is that right? Between three have, and five minutes, and you're going to be you're going to be a tough your, taskmaster. Tough task okay, I uh, I wasn't sure if there was going to be. Oh yes, there there are a few uh, few points that I um, had disseminated before. So first of all, maybe a quick introduction. I wasn't haven't been over here the last couple of days. My name is Niels Fiki. I work at WHO Europe, um, and I was involved in in the report that we published a few years ago about the evidence um, behind arts and health interventions. And uh, subsequently, uh, I'm working with some of you here in the room on, a, on an arts and health intervention in Denmark and, and Romania. So uh, um, I wanted to kick us off with, th with three thoughts that I have. Obviously, I'm, I'm talking from a more kind of international perspective. So some of the questions that were more specifically geared towards national policies, policies in your country, I'm probably not so um, uh, um, in such a great position to answer. But I thought I'd, I'd focus on the final of the three questions, which is the question about uh, um, critical analysis of existing policies. What challenges and gaps do you see? What is lacking for more efficient arts and health programs to take place in a sustainable and long-term perspective? And I, I wanted to make three points uh, in relation to that question and, and there on, on the screen in front of you. So first of all, um, I wanted to say a little bit about the fact that there is still a pretty uneven playing field, um, even within the European Union, certainly within Europe, and certainly, absolutely certainly, within the, uh, the geographic Europe that WHO operates in, um, which includes 53 member states, includes the uh, Commonwealth of Independent States, Caucasus, and, and so forth. So there's a very uneven understanding um, of what arts and health, culture for health, actually means. And I, I don't necessarily think that that has to be a, um, a, an impediment. It just has to be something that I think we have to be aware of. And, uh, and uh, um, if we are to pitch our, this idea of arts and health and culture and health in, in other countries. Um, because I think one thing that is, is definitely the case is that in all those places, um, you have activities that align with the activities that, uh, that um, we are undertaking. They might not be called arts and health, they might not be called arts and health interventions, it might not have the kind of methodological or, or theoretical frameworks that we apply to it, but they are certainly aligned with the, the things that we're doing, and um, often people recognize what we're doing intuitively. So that's the first point that I'd make, like to make. The second um, point is, 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 is more kind of political point, and that's to do with the challenges around cross-sectoral collaboration, um, which remain, I think, particularly challenging. Health, I mean, cross-sectoral collaboration is a buzzword. You, you hear it everywhere in policy. Um, it's something that I guess politicians often aspire to. Um, and although I think it does take place, it very rarely takes place between culture and health. Those two sectors tend not to, uh, um, be very communicative with each other. And so um, in this, so that's a, a pro and a con. It's, a, it's, it's problematic in the sense that you, you have to kind of forge new links. You have to have conversations. You have to meet people that you don't know about. You have to, you know, like build the bridges that aren't, uh, aren't there. But on the other hand, I think it's also a great and unique opportunity because in this space of multi-sectoralism, in this aspiration to be multi-sectoral, the idea that 
arts uh, or, or culture and health can actually work together viably on an, on an actual project in an actual space is a real opportunity. So I think it's something that we, uh, um, we need to articulate a little bit when we try to bring on board members from the, the health sector. And um, I'm very pleased, for instance, that EuroHealth is here. I think that's fantastic that, the, um, that we're bringing these conversations into, um, into, into the space. But I think, um, particularly for this project, um, we need to challenge ourselves to do more. Um, and then finally, I don't know, to, you know, this is kind of a little bit of a rant to nobody, um, because I'm not sure anybody's in the room who can do anything about this right now. But uh, um, there is still um, a real challenge around funding. There are niche funders, I think, uh, um, out there who, who uh, um, typically are in the arts space, who have an interest in this field. But there's very little in terms of, uh, of kind of sustained or a sustainable long term um, funding that can that can really drive change. Um, in the UK, um, there there have been some projects that uh, are not even a handful, less than a handful of projects that have been funded with substantial amounts of money to do large scale clinical trials uh, in relation to some arts and health interventions that is that are really driving forward not just the evidence base but also the exposure to this type of uh, um, um, activity, um, and and more of that is needed. And I think maybe. Uh, uh, hopefully, we can somehow uh, put our heads together and, and think of uh, ways to approach other funders or, or convince funders to invest more in this area. I heard the bell. That's me for now. Thanks very much. I just love that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's, uh, it, it's very interesting that you touch so clearly on the funding issue, because the funding issue has a side effect to it, which is about policymaking and how you actually frame funding, both public funding and non-public funding. So thank you for that one. I think that's an important one for us to keep with us as we go forward and as we go into the discussions group later on. Our next speaker on my list will be the first speaker to present a project and to tap into a project. But before we do that, I would like my good colleague, Maya, to just show you the mentee, because I would ask you to during the next presentations, find that little thing that we all carry with us. It's, it's now part of our body and we, we kind of live with it, sleep with it, have it next to us all the time and get into the Mentimeter. <laughs> and during the, the coming presentations, you will have the opportunity to write words. It's, it's gonna be a word cloud. So you, you can't write an essay, I'm afraid. Uh, it, it will just be one word, very short sentence. But the idea is to give us your reflections as we go along to kind of highlight challenges, think challenges, opportunities, disruption, maybe even dilemmas that you would like to discuss with this group later on and write them into the into the word cloud and then by the end of this session we will come back to it we will revisit it and in the break you will have an opportunity through our loving gadgets to vote for which of them you think we should focus on and then we will divide you into groups accordingly afterwards so please start the mentee when we start the presentations the next presenter coming up is Veltra Votele from Estonia Please, you're more than welcome to join me up here. Which of the two microphones would you prefer? You would prefer that one. You're more than welcome. Just take it. I will start uh, the camera to focus on you, and you have five minutes. All right. Hello to everyone. Thank you for the invitation to this uh, study visit on this wonderful topic. I will speak uh, about uh, the perspective uh, we, we have in, in Estonia. So open up the current the situation uh, how, on how culture and health are interconnected uh, in our country. Uh, I would like to start on the glimpses on our national strategies. So when we look uh, uh, in our national plan of culture uh, 2013, uh, we see this picture we have on the slide. And to be honest, uh, this is the only place where uh, uh, the interconnection between culture and health uh, is, uh, is written in this, this plan. On the other hand, uh, when we look at uh, the national plan, uh, national health plan, 
2030. Uh, this one does not say anything about uh, culture nor, nor arts. Uh, so from the strategic perspective, uh, the situation is, is not so wonderful, but uh, if we analyze uh, the factual situation, uh, I would say it's, it's also not so, so awful. So in Estonia, culture and arts are uh, financed uh, uh, by, by the state. It's, uh, it's a small but uh, steady financing. And basically artists are free to do whatever <laughs> they are used to do. They, they create. Uh, and when I select uh, uh, narrowly, uh, I focus narrowly on two aspects, uh, mental health and uh, theater. Uh, we see that there are plenty of projects uh, and produ productions uh, 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 that deal with uh, mental health. There have been uh, highly acclaimed projects that uh, rely on personal stories about uh, depression and anxiety. Uh, there are, are solo projects that also deal with uh, other common health, uh, mental health disorders. Uh, those projects have traveled through country, uh, whole country and have been highly popular. And there have been uh, participatory theater projects uh, that uh, engage the community. So when I look uh, from the perspective of, of uh, uh, mental health policy designer, I see a huge value these uh, projects have created. Uh, uh, they help to reduce uh, stigma. They help to raise awareness of uh, mental health problems and they help to notice uh, symptoms and motivate uh, people to seek help. So trying to conclude, despite the fact that the uh, connection uh, between health and uh, culture is, uh, is weak in, in our strategies, the actual situation uh, uh, is, is quite uh, tolerable, even without uh, strong incentives uh, uh, or, or nudging the art in, in this right direction. So my hypothesis is that without the strategic level lead, uh, uh, we do not uh, have this uh, bridging projects that uh, connect, connect these two uh, different words, worlds. And that's about it. <laughs> Sorry about the quick ending. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I'm fascist, just love it when people are before time. Uh, that's amazing. But, but obviously, we, we will try to balance this as, as good as we can. Thank you very much for saying something about how awareness is actually some, it, it's, it's something that matters in policymaking. And that awareness is something that we could also talk about, we can reflect about how can we actually through the projects, the initiatives that we see out there getting unfolded, some of the initiatives we heard on earlier today, how can we use them in the formation of new policies, in the awareness, the political awareness of what is actually needed in the formation of new policies could be one thing that is really important too. So thank you very much for that one. Our next speaker, that again, now you all get the, the setting, I will press a button, you will get the, the stage next to me. So our next speaker will be Lina Papricici from the Euro Health Net from Lithuania and from Brussels. And right now you're based in Brussels. Which of the microphones would you prefer? You will take that one. I will press the button and you are going. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Lina Papricici and I'm a project coordinator at uh, Euro Health Net. So we are a nonprofit uh, partnership of um, 
uh, health authorities or regional health authorities um, working on public health. So on health promotion and uh, disease prevention. And uh, we're trying to reduce inequalities through addressing uh, social determinants of health. <coughs> and um, I really see a lot of um, common ground for us to work together because uh, culture is also a lot about promoting and improving health. But what we shouldn't forget, and this is what I have many images on the slide, this is what I was asked to do. And uh, I have this um, iceberg. And uh, what we um, saw this morning about the moon, uh, the picture of the moon that we only see part of it, but the problem is bigger. So the health promotion iceberg is when we're trying to address with our actions only the disease that we see. So it's only the tip of the iceberg. And the actual contributors to that are the behavioral risk factors, but the majority of it are daily living conditions. So conditions in which we are born, we grow, we live, we work, but also the political environment, so the economic policies, the uh, gender uh, bias and uh, class. And uh, these are the things that we have to keep at the back of our mind when we're working on health promotion and disease prevention, being it the, in the health sector or the cultural sector. And uh, here I would like to just quickly give maybe two uh, things that come to my mind that are um, what we could do to, to work together. And one interesting uh, thing was um, what uh, Monica mentioned uh, about the uh, culture strategy uh, that came out in 2018, that it actually has a social pillar in it. And then I was reflecting, thinking of the European pillar of social rights, which does not have a culture component in it. And there is a big monitoring, uh, monitoring tool of implementation of European pillar of social rights. So I think there is uh, something to, to work on, uh, to work on there. And uh, okay, but the two things are the European child guarantee uh, where I think the culture sector could play a role because um, I don't know if you are familiar with uh, this uh, framework, but this is the um, uh, European Commission uh, launched uh, this in, uh, in June, and it's the comprehensive uh, framework to addressing poverty and social exclusion uh, of of children. So member states are invited to, well invited, they have to guarantee free and effective access to early childhood education and care, and also to education and extracurricular activities. And uh, there are frameworks, uh, funding frameworks, uh, such as the European Social Fund, as well as the Resilient and uh, Recovery Facility that uh, can be used to, to enact this, to bring this to life. Um, and one other thing is the uh, European um, Best Practice Portal which uh, has been launched uh, by the European Commission, the Directorate General for Health. And this is a repository of uh, good practices on health promotion and disease prevention and management of non-communicable diseases. And uh, member states, uh, as well as uh, independent uh, actors, uh, non-governmental organizations are encouraged to submit good practices to be evaluated uh, that uh, could then be transferred or upscaled in, uh, in other countries. And uh, this presents a, an opportunity for health and cultural sector to work together because we know that 
the new health program is bigger than ever with uh, 5 billion euros, just uh, finishing the, uh, the sentence. And 20% of this new program is for health promotion and disease prevention. So 20% of the 5 uh, billion euros are dedicated to that. And uh, new calls for proposals when they are launched. So many projects are taken from this pool of good practices that are in the best practice portal. So I really encourage you to, to submit your good practices. Uh, there are many criteria that they would have to meet, but uh, they are best practices. <laughs> so, um, so yes, and I'm happy to, to work together with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry for that slight brutal <laughs> alarm clock ringing, but it is a very efficient way just to say, time's out, friends. You know, that's how it works. Submit your best practices is also kind of meeting that point of view is that cross-sectorial collaboration is actually really difficult because what are the language, what are the the, the repository, what kind of backdrop do we work from? How do we communicate this in a good way? So by submitting that into another framework that we normally would submit it into also allows us to dive into another kind of referee, a paradigm that we are kind of uncomfortable to, but that's the first step. We have to take those first steps. So when you're focusing on challenges, you could please, you could actually have that as a, a thought as well. Oh, so sorry. I'm. S Thank you very much. Not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't like the attention. That's not. I. I don't want it. And I'm. I'm about to give it on to somebody else. Actually, uh, <laughs> very, very soon. Ignas Rubikas from Lithuania. Please, we met yesterday. Nice to see you again. And which of the microphones would you prefer? That is a stick, please. The stick. Yes. You stay to the stick. I stick with the stick. make sure that the camera will be on you and not on me. Please take on that. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Ignas Rubikas. I'm from Lithuania. I'm head of mental health unit at the Ministry of Health in Lithuania. And yeah, I don't have a slide. Uh, sorry for that. It was a technique. Tech, how do you say the email failed me yesterday evening? But yeah, I'll still talk through. So. Um, I'm really happy that I was invited in this collaboration. It's really, really refreshing to see all those experiences in so many countries here. I think that uh, I wouldn't be able to, you know, connect with all of you, but uh, I would love to. Uh, but uh, yeah, this uh, today I'll just present some examples from Lithuania, hands-on examples that we're trying to do with arts and mental health in Lithuania. So uh, the first thing is uh, we're trying to develop is art therapies. And this is a gradual process whereby uh, with, uh, in the last three years, we have actually legislated four, three, uh, diff four different um, types of art therapy, like music and drama and uh, dance and uh, visual arts, so that they can become um, legitimate and uh, equal uh, specialists in healthcare uh, system, which is, uh, I think, one of the main first uh, steps in order to like, integrate uh, arts in the healthcare system. Um, in Lithuania, these all uh, develop really rapidly with the help of the NGO sector, which is really takes initiative in this area. And uh, currently, we're undergoing a reform process where we're trying to make uh, art therapists part of the core team within uh, psychiatric daycare units so that they are not just uh, optional specialists, but they, that they are um, included in the core team uh, because uh, until this day, you know, daycare units were just a uh, way to uh, a place where, you know, people could spend their time safely, uh, but it was not uh, focused on intensive therapeutic approaches. And we think that one of the aspects is us therapy, of course, this uh, like uh, talking therapies and other aspects, but this is a very important way of reaching patients. And uh, focus group, uh, one of the priority groups is, of course, children and adolescents, because as we see, it's really um, important to reach them. And uh, often the, you know, talking therapies are not uh, 
effective, especially for smaller children. And, you know, medication is, all, of course, the last uh, resort measure. Yeah, uh, the, the second uh, thing that we're trying to uh, develop in Lithuania is uh, the program of social prescription. So you might her have heard of that, you know, it's a, I think the UK has a well-developed this system whereby primary care specialists such as GPs, they refer uh, a person to uh, cultural and other kind of activities uh, that can um, mitigate the social aspects of um, health, which are, I think, often forgotten in healthcare sector. Um, yeah, um, the pilot project we launched in 2020 and in 2024, we're now preparing for a full-scale um, launch of the project in collaboration between four ministries, which I think uh, I'm, we are quite proud of, which is health, uh, culture, education, and social security and labor, each having their own functions within the program, increasing the um, su uh, supply of activities, in including uh, cultural and educational and securing uh, 10 million euros of funding for this program within uh, five years. Um, yeah, so um, this program has been already enshrined in the strategic documents. So I think that's also kind of security from, um, you know, this sometimes happens that, you know, a new political um, leadership comes and then they say, oh, no, it's everything that's been done, it's bad. You can start something else. So I hope this will not happen with this one. Hopefully, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Um, at least I'll lift it to see. Um, yeah, uh, we have a, a somewhat a rough start with this program because uh, there's some challenges with actually understanding the added value, um, how it differs from just having cultural um, activities, for example, in the regions, because what this program does, it has a coordinator that first ensures the quality, and the second is uh, to, um, uh, you know, connect, you know, people, especially elderly, elderly people, people who come to the GPs to talk about their life problems, and they, you know, really uh, spend a lot of uh, precious uh, time with them. Um, so, you know, there's some challenges with us uh, to understand what is the added value and then measure, evaluate it. So I think we'll overcome that. Um, so, and uh, we also have other public health interventions that I'll not, not talk through <laughs> <laughs> because the time has come up. <laughs> yeah, so thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> it is so brutal, but thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. And thank you also for, for talking about cross Camera, 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 Nils. Thank you for just highlighting that you actually are about to, to put a project into the sea, which is a cross-ministerial initiative. I think that too is quite important. How we can actually, yes, yeah, it's, it's a very nice t-shirt. Uh, how we can actually work with different perspectives that are, are interesting from the different sides of policy making that I think that too could be something we should carry along. Thank you very, very much. Now we're going back to Denmark, uh, because my colleague Eva Jens, who is part of the regional cultural office in, in Greater Copenhagen area has something to share with us. Eva, please come up. Which of the microphones? That one? The stick. This, that's more popular. That's good. Good. The word is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I will not actually talk so much about the projects that I'm managing. I'm managing two different projects um, uh, across nine different municipalities in the, in the Copenhagen area. Um, but I won't talk so much about them because um, there are so many projects and so many good examples. We all know that art is good for health. So basically, we, with that established, um, I'd uh, rather talk about this fact that um, there are so many impacts of what 
we do, the way that we work with arts and health that reach beyond the, the individual. It's not only the person who is um, sort of the target of uh, arts intervention that is um, that's being affected. And there are actually um, a whole circle around uh, the, the, the individual who are also um, being impacted, uh, being influenced by, by this work. And I think that in order to, um, to uh, send some signals to the political level, both nationally and, uh, and in European setting, I think we have to be much better at actually uh, showing all of these collateral effects. There are so many different levels that are impacted by what we do. Um, and I find that really, really important to, to impact. So identifying and, and highlighting some of these effects, I think it's crucial when we seek to implement uh, new policies in the field. At the Danish level, we don't have any national um, policy that, um, that is, is focused on, uh, on arts and health. Um, there are some of the five regions in Denmark, especially the central um, Denmark uh, region, which we are in right now, and the northern uh, region, that have um, policies that, uh, that concern this. The other regions don't. The, the central uh, the, or the region that, um, that I'm based in, there is no um, policy on the area, and that, it's very frustrating, I think. Um, and then there are some municipalities that have, especially Aarhus, have a, a policy in the arts and health area collaborations. But I'd like to highlight just some of the different um, impacts that uh, working with this field can have on a not individual level. And uh, if you look at the, um, the people that are working with it professionally, we heard about it this morning. I was very happy to hear about the SOL uh, project because the nurses were mentioned people who are actually working with, um, with patients, they also have a positive um, gain from working with this. We heard about that their stress level actually was decreased when they were listening to the music in this setting. We all know that especially nurses uh, these past couple of years, but basically every caretaker um, are under massive stress and there are so many sick leaves and it's a huge um, expense in every country that we have all these people going down with stress. So if you could decrease their level of stress by working with this, you already can save some money there. Um, we have um, many projects, obviously, that could be like a music therapy for dementia patients that can decrease uh, the level of aggressive behavior from uh, the, the patients and thereby reducing some of the stress level in the caretakers who work with the, um, the, the dementia patients. You can look at it from a social point of view, arts and prescription in prison settings um, can actually decrease the level of uh, conflicts between the inmates, but also between the inmates and the um, staff working, the prison wards uh, staff working, decreasing the number of stress um, sick leaves in that area. And you can look at it from like the psychiatric point of view, um, art classes for anorectic patients. We have a beautiful project in, uh, in Fien. Uh, that works with this, and it gives the psychiatric um, staff a nonverbal way of communicating uh, or an insight into the, how these uh, patients perceive themselves. And that helps them communicate better with the patients, but also with the relatives. And that can decrease the stress level and the anxiety level and so on, so on, so on, also with the relatives and the professional level maybe leading as well to less um, sick leaves. So we can basically show that there are enormous savings to be found if you work professionally with this area. And in that way, we can use the public funding better. Uh, also, this thing about the cross-sectoral uh, collaborations that we've talked about earlier. I mean, the aim for everyone, I'm a public civil servant, and our aim should be to provide better service for the citizens. Uh, but most um, departments, we don't really communicate cross-sectorally. But when we do, and we can find these projects that actually can function as a sort of mediator between the different um, sectors and the different ways of working, you can create projects and, um, and um, yeah, levels of working that are much more appropriate, both for the citizens, but also for the economic, uh, yeah, <laughs> anyway. And I find that this is really important to highlight because this area about especially mental health, it's a wicked problem as uh, I'm sure many of you know this term. And the only way that you can solve wicked problems is, I'm quoting, collaborative strategies where different stakeholders work together to develop and impl implement solutions. 
So that's my message, basically, that we have to highlight these all these different uh, extra, the, the, the added value that we can have in these projects. So. Thank you very, very much, Eva. <laughs> Lovely. And also, thank you for highlighting the effect and, and the importance of different stakeholders actually being part of the solution. Very, very good. Our next speaker, we stay in the Nordics, we go to Finland, to Osa, Mary Leinen. Also, which one? Are you also a stick person? Okay, yeah, that, then everything's so much easier for me. I will just press this one and then you are on to go, yeah. Thank you. Art is like a bridge over troubled waters. We learned today at, o at Aarhus Hospital that they use live music and it decreases stress and um, anxiety and pain. Um, in Ukraine, they have violin concerts in bomb shelters. They show movies to children in the metro stations because it provides joy and hope and community. In Finland, there was a boy with a severe mental health issues who haven't had taken and made an eye contact with no one for ages. And with the help of game art, he started to open up. There was an old lady uh, who, uh, with Alzheimer's who haven't communicated for a year with no one. And with the help of folk dance, and songs, she started to sing along. And when I tell all this to politicians, they say, yes, Rosa, I do agree. What should I do? Then I have the same answer as anyone from the culture for health field in Finland, because we have made a co common statement. We have the same kind of a shared vision that what should be done now? And we say, well, there's a, this wonderful reorganization of social and health services in Finland going on right now. That we are reorganizing the social health services from local level to regional level. That you should now guarantee that in every strategy, in every region, and all those like a principal policy papers regions have, culture for health is mentioned. It's written down in the strategies, whatever strategy, not only the cultural, but whatever. And then take care that there's always in every region, a person who is responsible for culture for health. So whoever is picked up from Finland, she or he will say these same things. It's important always to answer to politicians. Pernilla asked two questions. Uh, one was about Bauhaus, the new Bauhaus project. Well, you should uh, take care that 1% of every construction site in, in when whatever you build, 1% is uh, of the cost is, is used to art. Because the why the original Bauhaus was so powerful and really changed the lifestyle we wanted was that art and artists were involved, involved in, in the Bauhaus project. So let's do the same now. And also in health committee, you should do the same as those in every region in Finland to include culture for health in every policy paper health committee makes. And then this all wonderful things can, hap uh, can happen and Scandinavian hunks will be there when I'm in the elderly home. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Scandinavian hunks might be available. I, that sounds like a new, you know, a newspaper article tomorrow. What's going on in Aarhus University? Okay, uh, <laughs> thank you, Leticia Maillot from from France. You're next to to come up here. I really like that point that you understretched here as well as a regional leader. The the necessity of having you said leader. Maybe I could just extend that little word and say regional leadership because regions really matter just as something we carry along the importance of regional leadership Leticia you're a stick person too and now the camera is on you thank you Rosa I had prepared um, something very scholar to 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 respond to the command 
uh, with the presentation of the policy in France. I don't know if still it's pertinent, but you give me some of a... Uh, Ideas. <laughs> well, I'd like to, to, to achieve by saying strategy must be pushed until the strategy on each ILF facility, uh, until this level, until each ILF facility. And a strategy, a strategy cannot exist if there is not someone who is identified to, to push this strate strategy and make it become reality. Uh, so I will come to this point um, before I finish this presentation, okay? So, yes, you have uh, the principal uh, axis of the presentation. So in France, we have a specific frame um, since, I don't know, you see, the, you see everything. Uh, it's, uh, it's 23 years old now. Uh, we have a frame in national level to uh, associate culture and health, not as culture for health, but both together as partnership. Uh, I really wanted to, to mention this because it's very different to use culture for health and to stimulate partnerships between culture area and health area. It's not the same thing. So um, this, uh, this policy is um, involved on, on national level and then on each regional level, level we have a regional policy uh, who is developed uh, between the, the representatives of Ministry of Health and Ministry of Culture. Sorry, I was I, I have my note, but I can't read it right now. I don't know why. <laughs> so on each region, it's different on each region. That's uh, one point I wanted to tell. Uh, something it's different on, uh, from one country to another. And uh, in France, it's different. Difference are exist existing inside of the, of the country. So uh, we, we approach art and culture as a citizen right, as it was uh, already said. And it's only uh, like this that we develop the, the, the policy. Um, management dimensions, I told already that it's uh, very different from a region to another. The partner partnerships are different, the, the, the resources are different. They are resources that come from public institutions, uh, culture and health institutions, but uh, one point is it's very low resources. Uh, if uh, I can... Um, Je sais plus, rebondir. Well, <laughs> yesterday, uh, Michael told us that he has uh, a team, a staff with five persons who were managing 20 projects. Uh, for me, it's a dream. Uh, in my region, Paris region, uh, we were, we used to be maximum one, two, or three persons for at least. Um, 70 actions uh, each year. Uh, I'm talking about the actions, but uh, actions, it's not sufficient. If you have action, you have to, 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 to go on the, um, on the places. You, you have to see how, how it's on, on the local level. You, you will evaluate them. You will communicate communicate you will um, also need to 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 um, to have how we say a training offer and awareness actions uh, so all of this takes a lot of time and uh, it's not only uh, the financement or the funds that has, that are the question or the number of action but all that is in in Intermediaire, sorry for my English, it's uh, very, very bad. Um, I also wanted to see, to say one thing that uh, we have maybe to clarify some points in hospital when we are talking about art and culture, what we are talking about. Until uh, this month, from this morning, we are talking about free. Uh, different kinds of action, and we saw di three different kinds of action, artistic actions, therapeutic actions, and 
animation, what we call animation, uh, that doesn't um, necessitate any participative implication from the patients. Uh, like when we are going to, 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 to see one, co to, to listen one concert, we are not active, we are receiving it, it's one point. But when we are practicing with other people, with artists and with um, health staff, something else is going on and we are talking about something else and these creations that can be um that can be between artists patients and uh, staff uh, what kind of creation is it what uh can we recognize it in cultural sector or not what is the position of this creation? What is the position of the artist that works with people and not only are in cultural establishments? Are they recognized? Maybe not, it's, maybe it's not sufficient. I also wanted to finish with one point. It's totally different that, than, um, than this, but uh, if we are talking about art in, health facilities, we need someone to think about the strategy. We need someone to think about the sense. We need someone uh, qualified to, to, who will be the guarant and who will also talk with the artists that are knocking on, the, on their door. And uh, most of the time in health facilities, there is no one for this. If you are an artist, you want to, to, to work with, um, I don't know, any, any, any health facility. Uh, you can send 10 mails, who will respond you? you? You can call, but who will you call? We need reference. And I think this is a point, a very important point, if you want to, to work concretely uh, on what's going on in reality. And for other uh, effects, not therapeutic effects. I wanted to tell you because um, we, we, we pass very much time to say we need proof, we need proof, we need to prove what's going on. But uh, I think we all know what's going on when art and culture are so, is somewhere. We all know what's going on. And if you want to know more about what's going on in health facilities, I'm not talking about therapeutic aspect, but a lot of things can, can um, go on. And read this book, it's, it's, it's in French, I know, but it's very easy. It's very easy to read it. <laughs> Thank you very much. And also thank you for, for this, this notion, this perception of, of what we are actually talking about, art between, or artistic interventions between taking part, participation, actual participation, or just reception. Because I think that's a very important, important point also for us to focus on. Our next speaker, Marta Krivade from Latvia. Marta, please. Hi. Okay. Hi, and please don't put my first slide yet. <laughs> <laughs> I will I will say when it should be done. Okay, so I'm Marta and I'm from the Ministry of Health and I'm advisor to the minister. So basically I'm a politician <laughs> and I'm mostly working with mental uh, health policy and politics. So the Latvian healthcare system now since three years are is working with art therapists who have like specific role in a psychiatrists uh, team. And I'm very happy actually that the state clinics, the state mental health clinics are using uh, uh, this uh, power, art power of, of art more and more in their themes. And uh, also, in Latvia, there is only one community-based uh, health service for adolescents facing mental health problems, uh, which has expanded rapidly in Latvia during last year. And um, it's worth to highlight that uh, uh, they have this uh, out of 70 people team consisting of uh, psychologists and psychiatrists and so on. Uh, 10 people are different um, art uh, therapists. 
So, but, um, and actually it's very interesting that art therapists in Latvia are more included, like officially included in healthcare system than for example, psychologists who decided 10 years ago that they don't want to be included in healthcare system because it's also, they need to change their educational system. However, it's, uh, but it's more interesting is that uh, the power of arts in Latvia is much less visible in what is supposedly relatively less bureaucratical and more easily inclusive field like health prevention, public health education and processes supporting medical therapy and treatment. And here I would like to tell you about one place where I as a policymaker have high hopes uh, in the near future. So uh, in Latvia, it's very strange that the uh, Ministry of Health has its own museum. It's very, very old. It's uh, like dark, but it has a unique archive uh, in Europe. And uh, unfortunately, so far it offered its visitors more like creaky and dark rooms. Some razor gruesome physiological exhibitions through which adults could easily like, you know, pass groups of school children. But then accidentally in 2017, uh, it was, uh, it, it hosted the personal exhibition called Invisible Zones presented by the Polish artist uh, Artur Rzniewski, it's quite famous one. And in this exhibition, the artists, artists highlighted the social side effects of disability, where limitations are not caused by disability, but by society. And unexpectedly, a while before the opening of the exhibition, organizers, organizers were reminded of this uh, existence of social barriers in Latvia, because uh, the Ministry of Health itself banned uh, and censored the display of an advertising banner on the museum's wall, which used one of the artist's photographs included in the exhibition. And now you could maybe put the, the, the slide. Uh, it's actually uh, one of the artist's photographs included in this exhibition, and it's a picture of a naked body affected by disability, and it was basically censored. And actually, as a politician and communication specialist as well, I can understand it because for a quite conservative society, which Latvia really has, offering such an intervention all at once without discussion and preparation of all the parties, well, it's a loud, but not the only way uh, for art to remind of its power. Okay, this is like just uh, one interesting uh, happening. But uh, two years later, we had a uh, good luck because uh, uh, one of actually Latvia's greatest art curators joined the, the museum as the new director. And he sees this place as a zone of its kind, a focal point where the arts, health workers, policy makers, and scientists can meet, uh, like a think tank. And uh, a bit our plans were canceled because of pandemics, but uh, I think uh, it will go on. Uh, and uh, yes, um, because because uh, we we have this uh, deal with the new directors that uh, we want to show to artistic intervention interventions that uh, art has this healing power, which um, are particularly related to human awareness and resp responsibility for one's own health. Sorry, I will no quickly finish. By the way, speaking of this uh, taking responsibility and also the self uh, perception, the museum in Riga is located right next to the Russian embassy. And since last week, it has been impossible for anyone going in or out of the Russian embassy not to notice the next slide, please. This man staring back at them from the wall of the museum building. So, Yes, it's politics, but it's also health. And it's it's really about health because um, health is very frequently based on how both parties, the doctor and the patient, manage to be aware of their resources, consequences of their actions, 
and also that they take responsibility of their actions and choices. So that is why I very much look forward to this place of this museum and uh, that the museum could prove the synergy bet between arts and our healthcare system. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marta. Wonderful, wonderful presentation, wonderful image. Um, but also quite, quite interesting that you as a policymaker is that close to the process. I think that that too is something we could actually reflect on and, and maybe even have a conversation on later on. Now we are going on to, you mentioned a Polish artist and we are going to Poland, Bartosz, but. But Zivich, you're more than welcome to join me so, up here. Yeah, you can introduce yourself. I'm sorry about my phone. That's fine. Thank, uh, thank you. My name is Bartosz Bartoszewicz. I'm a deputy mayor of the city of Gdynia. The city of Gdynia is the uh, 12th biggest city in Poland, located on the north by the Baltic Sea. Um, we're not a really big city, but as I mentioned, 12th biggest in Poland. I just also like to thank you for the organizers, the people who came up with the idea of a uh, cultural health project. Uh, when I talked with my team about this project and we had to make a decision if we want to be involved in it or not, that was a really simple decision and a really quick one. Uh, and then I found out that the first meeting is in Aarhus. Aarhus, am I correct? Thank you. And I said to myself, at last. Uh, why I did that is because I'm also a big fan of smart cities theme. Uh, they all think about smart cities, but the real smart cities, which is not about technology, it's about quality of life, where technology can help us increase the quality of life in cities. And one of the first study done over the world was done on the 2007 year on the university in Vienna by the professor uh, Giffinger, if I remember correctly. And there was a ranking of the smartest city, uh, mid-sized cities in Europe. Uh, on the first place was Luxembourg, and the second was Aarhus. And then on the next edition, which was in 2013, Aarhus was on the first place. So I was really looking forward to be here and spend a lot of time to see what you're doing here. So it's so amazing. But in fact, uh, the last few weeks changed my life. I just came in the morning. I have to leave just right after workshops today as we are placed for more than 1,000 of, um, of uh, refugees of the war. We are preparing city to make it as friendly as it can be for, for those who, who run uh, from the Ukraine. In fact, as a big fan of smart cities, I have to mention that from my perspective, and not only as a private person, as also as a deputy mayor, smart cities, there are 24 different uh, faces. It has 24 different faces. It, it has 24 different steps to become a smart city. And one of it, it's really important, is access to culture. And it means a culture on a big level. Like uh, if we are organizing big film festival, it has to be for the uh, people involved in this uh, festival as well as for the citizens. It's also about smaller projects. It's about what we do in the city, but what is really, really important. And from my perspective, is this um, especially important because I'm not a politician. I was never in the party as well as the mayor of the city. I'm from the NGOs. And we cooperate very closely with NGOs, and it includes uh, one of the theater, which is in the railway main railway station of the city of Gdynia in the basin. There is a theater organized by NGOs, but also founded by the by the city. Uh, what is really important right now, and what culture can do a lot, uh, from my perspective, there are two special group of people that we try to focus on. One are elderly people, seniors. Uh, for the many years, we tried to convince them, go outside, meet with others, just do something, don't stay at home. First of all, it's healthy. It's also efficient in the, in the budget way. I think this is obvious. We have to know it, that as long as the person is active, it's better for the community. We did a lot in terms of activating people to do something. During the last year, we changed it. We told them, stay at home, don't go outside, don't have relations. Another group are kids, elderly youth, uh, not elderly youth. Uh, we told them, don't sit by the computer, go outside, make friends, go for a walk, do some projects. And for the last two years, we tell them, stay at home, stay by the computer and work, learn from home. Uh, so we have to do a lot and we can use culture projects to activate all of those people to make them healthier. Uh, let me mention in the end something which I truly believe is really, really important. This is also study, but study done in the United States. This is the longest study you've probably heard about it, done on the Harvard University by the, another person and they're trying to find out what makes people happy. Uh, you probably I see some faces which are smiling and they know that. 
they made a study for eight, more than eight years right now, asking the same people every year, what makes you happy? And they came up to the three results. One of the results is that what is, well, there is a level where for us, the most important is a really nice car, really nice house, holidays. But there is one thing, and this is for everyone. First of all, this is a quality of relations. We have to, we need to have a lot of relations. Secondly, it's the quality of these relations. It's not a, only about social media that we have thousands of friends in our group, but this is also a quality of these relations. And the third result, which is really, really important, good relations make us happier and, and healthier. And I truly believe that the culture projects let us make a lot of really good relations. And I think this is something what you have to focus on right now. And the culture is really, really important. If you want to, if you want to um, run the city where the people are happy and really, really healthy. That's the thing what we are trying to do in Gdynia. And I didn't hear the advice um, a little bit before time. Thank you. You're absolutely before time. Fantastic. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you, Bartosz, and, and good luck to, to all the fantastic efforts you're doing in Poland uh, in these severe times that we're all facing. So, with you on that one. Our last speaker, Carmen Valero, will join us on stage. And are you too a state person? That, that is so easy. I will press this one and you're on. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for inviting me to also give an input here. Uh, my name is Carmen Valero. I work as a program manager and in the area of advocacy um, at the international NGO Red Noses Clown Doctors. Um, so I can say that I come from the field uh, or from the practitioner's perspective, uh, but it's so great to be here because um, our organization started to work 25 years ago uh, with uh, professionally trained artists uh, going to hospitals. Um, but uh, since then, we have been doing this kind of without a frame um, that gives us some kind of structure uh, around um, to, to support us to do our work better. So uh, I'm really excited to see um, these initiatives because I hope that together, yeah, we can um, have more impact uh, for arts and health. Um, so just very quickly uh, about our organization, we work in nine European member states and also in the Middle East in two countries in uh, Jordan and Palestine. And uh, while our work started with children in the hospitals, uh, in the meantime, we are also working with children with disabilities, uh, a lot with elderly people in care homes, uh, as well as with refugees. And since our goal is um, to not only have an impact at the individual level, um, meaning yeah, working directly with the target groups uh, in interactive uh, artistic activities, we also want to influence the institutions uh, we work in, um, in a positive way. And that's, for example, why we also work with healthcare staff, uh, with uh, nurses or also with uh, carers in elderly homes by giving uh, humor workshops. Uh, and finally, yes, we want on a system level to see arts and health um, integrated um, structurally uh, and in a sustainable well in uh, health settings, in social settings and development settings. Um, yeah, and from our perspective, some of the uh, very important steps to reach this uh, in the future will be, as we all know, to work on having more research to show our impact. Um, I think that we as Red Noses um, International have a very good basis from which we could do great research because we do regular interventions since a very long time and in multiple countries, uh, which uh, can be also very comparable and give great insights, but uh, all of this needs resources. And um, I would also um, very welcome the opportunity um, to have more collaboration in research in terms also of having some more innovative research practices. We have recently started uh, to work with participatory action research. So to really include also the people affected as well as their environments and their carers in the research. Uh, asking together what do we want to find out and how do we want to find out about this. And I think in uh, terms of having a more patient-centered focus in healthcare 
also here is um, a point where we can do something. Um, another point that I uh, think is important uh, in the future is trainings for healthcare staff, um, health and care staff on the impact of arts and health. We do give universities or um, in institutions we work with. And we have seen that when we do give humor workshops to staff, the impact of our work is actually greater because they understand better what we do, how we do it, and are more open to collaborate uh, with us in a deeper way. Um, yeah, so that's uh, some of the things that I think would be important and to have this education um, uh, in curriculas manifested kind of in universities, but also on the job trainings. Um, yeah, and last but not least, um, I was also asked to talk a little bit about uh, our responses to some current events and challenges out there. Um, we do work with refugees uh, also regularly in Greece and, uh, for example, in the Balkans. And we have also increased our work there because we have seen that there is so much need for it. And here also, I think that arts uh, can do more in development settings, in settings with refugees. Um, for example, in refugee camps in Greece, there would be a huge need to have medical centers that are truly patient and children friendly and safe so that people, including artistic intervention, so that people feel safe to go there, like to go there, and in the end will have a positive memory of their interaction with the medical system. Uh, so we see huge potential also to do more here. Um, so I'll quickly close. <laughs> yeah, with um, the war in Ukraine, we have also been visiting IDPs in Ukraine since uh, many years now, this year, our mission to Ukraine will be probably canceled. Uh, but uh, with our partner organizations um, in Poland, uh, Slovakia, uh, Lithuania, and Austria, we are going to the reception centers uh, to work um, there. So maybe <laughs> even in uh, your case, I hope that there um, can be artistic intervention supporting you with the uh, reception of refugees. Um, yes, and if you're interested to learn more, just approach me. Uh, last but not least, I want to say concerning COVID-19 that, um, yes, it had a huge impact on us as well because we were not allowed in the institutions during some time, but we were lucky to switch uh, quickly and uh, to have interventions that are outside online, and they actually had a great impact because there was such a big need for connection. But it was a real eye opener for us as well, in the sense of um, telling us we really need to discuss as a society what the role of arts uh, is in health and care settings. Because at the time when we were needed maybe the most, we were not considered often um, core staff that it's essential to have there. So um, in, in this sense, um, I'm so happy to see these discussions. And I think it's important to develop frames to give us a place in the system. Yeah. Thank you very, very much, Parmen. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, and thank you to all our amazing 13 speakers. Uh, it has been a very multi-voiced entrance to, to what we are going to do next, which is to open up for a relatively short conversation. We will have about 10 minutes in this room, in this saloon here online, you will be able to follow us as well by raising the digital hand and then I will see if I can allow you in. And for you guys who are here for the next 10 minutes, there's, there's a very simple uh, rule, a simple game rule, you could say, raise one hand if you have something you would like to add, a thought you would like to do, one finger as we always do. But if somebody like Nils, for instance, says something that is really, really interesting, and Mikkel just has to respond to it very, very fast. Two, you can go out there and you can surpass the road, the road of speakers and you get 30 seconds. Okay, so two fingers, you have 30 seconds and it's right now, one finger, you're in the line of speakers and you have time, okay? Be careful which fingers you use. Yeah, be careful which <laughs> fingers you use. And, you, and three fingers, hands, double hands, stand up, it doesn't count at all. So that's the rule. Okay. <laughs>
Anybody who immediately from, from top of mind has something you would like to add before I start asking questions to the panel? That, yeah, okay, Miguel. Please introduce yourself when you rise up. You will be able to get a microphone. You can have this one. Great, thanks. Yeah, my name is Mikkel. I'm from Central Denmark region, uh, one of the hosts here today. And thank you so much for all your contributions, especially uh, Bartosz, your your story about having gone, uh, <laughs> having to go home and and flying since uh, four uh, in the morning and and going home to to say hello to a lot, uh, thousands of fugitives. It's it's moving. Um, no, one of the things that someone said was that, that we need to have policies, but we also need to have someone in charge of arts and health. That's really what we're trying to do here in Central, Central Denmark region. And what I sort of feel is working because it's not enough just to have some words and some policy. You have someone, you, you need to have someone dedicated to working. Uh, to be working in this field and and as as a lot of diff difficulties uh, around which sector should pay for these interventions having a team or someone working in this field pushing and trying to make build bridges between sectors research everything it, i i really i really think it seems to be working here with us so so i think it's a really strong point that people on the ground and policies are needed. Can I just ask you a question? That team of yours, is that cross-sectoral? It is, yes, we, uh, I come from, I, I've got a cultural background. I'm, I'm in the culture innovation team in the region. And I've, I'm surrounded by, by people who are in the health innovation team and and my task my primary task is along with morton and sonia here it is to support the cultural industries uh, cultural actors libraries theaters musicians and and support their growth and their possibilities and my uh, colleagues from the health uh, innovation team their primary uh, goal is to help uh, hospitals and uh, psychiatry people working in those areas and our shared goal is to make results create create a change basically facilitate change yes okay because that that means i'm, I'm just thinking about what you said and as, as your second point about collaboration being difficult and now you have the global perspective is, is this the, where, where we should look for the solutions this kind of cross-sectorial collaboration in teams with a very clear public mandate because it's a public body you'll get a microphone so okay ah okay or i could come to you um <laughs> so so i i, I mean I, I think there is no one size fits all solution here and i think that the challenge is to try and figure out what works you know what what will work in different settings and sometimes that's going to happen organically i think you know maybe Mikkel, it's right right to say that in 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 your particular case this has grown over the last few years it happened organically some things fell into place um we got connected you know and and uh, and you know not that i certainly don't want to take any credit for it but but you know like things happened but but things things happened that created this uh, this uh, um, environment, um, and I, but I think it's going to be very different in different settings. I mean, I'm I'm amazed that uh, um, you know in some ministries of health there are people who uh, who have this as a hat, you know, who are already interested in this uh, in this topic and who are pushing it um, from a ministry of health uh, um, angle. So I, I think there's going to be a lot of different ways of getting there. But the key is to try and spot the opportunities and to recognize when something is becoming more than just a hobby uh, and turns into something that has momentum and, and that has a, a, a kind of a, a potential path forward. But I don't think there's going to be a kind of, you know, a simple uh, one size fits all solution. It'll be very different in, in many different uh, circumstances. It would be very different in many different circumstances. Yes, please. 
Thank you. Um, I'm a lobbyist and a politician uh, is, uh, for my background. And uh, basically I do only cross sectoral lobbying. I don't lobby like Minister of Culture because it's his job to promote culture. But uh, when I meet the Minister of Social and, and Health or Minister of Foreign, uh, Foreign Affairs or Minister of, uh, of um, Industries, I have to know those political fields and appreciate that knowledge and really, really like a, not only read my newspapers, but read all the, all the mm, papers and strategies they do in those sectors. So it's, it's kind of a, you have to, if we want to be bigger as a culture, culture and art sector and do this cross sectoral work, we have to really like do the work properly and, uh, learn to speak the language the others do. Learn to speak the language the others do. I, I'm, th I'm thinking about politics because we got a, a request from, uh, from the MA, both the MIPs actually, and they will have a coffee on it as well. But I'm, I'm looking at you, Monica. What kind of recommendations is actually needed to get, for instance, a transnational body like the European Commission, the European Parliament to start working? Well, we have uh, worked on what we call mainstreaming of culture. It's a brutal world, <laughs> word, but it's basically meaning that we work with colleagues in other directors general to make sure, you know, from colleagues dealing with taxes until up to colleagues dealing with agriculture policies or whatnot, uh, there is a red thread, which is culture. Um, it works to a certain extent. Uh, we became sort of victims of our success because then they started asking us all kinds of uh, questions and inputs for their own calls for proposals and, and the programs and so on. Um, I think we need to continue and to work more in the, in the health area uh, from this point of view. Of course, you cannot go uh, at the same speed with all kinds of cultural topics because culture is very broad. So we also work on, you know, copyright. Uh, with certain colleagues, we work on on uh, a lot of funding for cultural and creative uh, sectors and industries. On um, you know, skills. On so, so in all these areas, you have different uh, other directorates general which are in charge. So it's another. <laughs> Uh, as you as you say, um, the colleague from Finland, another uh, language, uh, another uh, angle, and so you always have to adapt. So at one point, you have to maybe approach them um, bilaterally. To but but I think with the um, European Parliament, we can be, um, receive a, an input, a, an encouragement from them, and in different th th this can take different uh, formal. Uh, uh, formal approaches, but like an encouragement to work more together between these two sectors. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Any more comments? Any more reflections? Coffee is waiting. But before we get that far to the coffee, I will just go back because we have some, some other gaming rules. I would like you, Maya, to show us the word cloud. Could you please do that? Now look at that. Wow. Take a really good look at that because that, that's the word cloud. We are going to select the seven topics that we will then go out into groups to discuss. And one of the groups will be online. So you guys who are with us online will have to stay on the link in the, in the open Zoom room. And then we will come back to you right there as well. But take a look at this. It's a very interesting, uneven understanding, funding, advocacy, quite big. We have asked Maya to try to organize all the words into words that we can then choose from. So when we come back for the coffee, we will start the next session with a very short selection of of the different issues. So we will have to ask you to use your mentee again, but we will do that in exactly 15 minutes. So now we will stretch our legs, we will have a pause and have a break and we will get something to drink and you 
who are with us from home, you will also have the opportunity to stretch a leg and close the, the screen for a moment before you come back. So thank you for being with us. Thank you to the speakers. Thank you very much. Now we are going to the fun kind of collaborative electoral part of the exercise today. So please, Maya, could you show us the questions that are now on Menti that we have to choose from? Just I'm standing here, so I'll... <laughs> Pray for Wi-Fi. Rank the most significant challenges in arts and health cross-sectorial cooperation. Go to menti.com and the code is 4133000. Lost the menti, could you please give us a hand it back to us there so we already have four people voting yeah. so maya has been able to limit it into 10 areas of interest Clear picture. Almost. Duty competition between place seven and place eight. Uneven awareness and lack of. And the application of specialists. Yeah. Okay. 30 seconds. Thirty seconds. Vision. This is health vision. Culture health, culture and health vision. Ladies and gentlemen, stop voting now. Stop voting now. And I just received an invisible letter saying we have a result. Group number one, and group number one will follow my colleague. If you are very much into the question of poor communication understanding between the sectors, you should follow my colleague for a discussion here. You should follow her around here. Good. Group number two will be discussing creating policy supported funding. And that will follow Mafalda. Also here. So try to not establish yourself into conflict zones when you're working in the same room. Third group, group number three, lack of strategy level in arts and health. Lack of strategy level will follow Tere. Lack of strategy levels in arts and health. Group number four, sustainability of programs is online. Group number four, that's you guys online. You will be the people discussing this and you will be led by Ugne, who's actually already online. That's amazing. Fantastic. Already sitting. Group number five. Well, I think actually, if I remember right, it's me. <laughs> I, 
and uh, you will follow me discussing the question. Ah, look at that. Thank you so much of inequalities. And we will do that in room 301. I will need help to find that. Group number six, lacks of connecting policies. That's you. And we will be, you will be downstairs. And group number seven, uneven awareness. That's you. You're also going downstairs. Okay. Now you just have to decide which group you want to go to. Okay. Okay, I will just uh, to you. My uh, group number two will come in as group number seven. Uh, so we will start the presentation with one, continue with group number three, and then stop with group number two. In and um, I hope that you all had some wonderful and great and in-depth conversations. I really enjoyed ours, the one that I had the privilege of being part of. So I'm looking forward, and I hope you're all looking forward to hear what you, what the discussions were all about. The Jamboard will be shared here behind me. Uh, I think Maya will show each group as we go by. So I think we will just, to keep the order, we will start with group number one. And I, I know that group number two will come in late because they have had some difficulties with the technique, but we'll manage that. So group number one, challenge, poor communication, understanding between sectors. Who would like to, to say something? Nils, please. Yeah, so I, I am the um, official rapporteur of Group 1 um, by default, because I was the only one to volunteer. Um, and I have to say this is going to be a little bit complicated because I kind of, uh, we had a, a note taker, um, and I think the notes went into the Jamboard, so I didn't take diligent notes. So I'm going to be talking a little bit from memory. Um, and I encourage anyone from the group to uh, intervene if I've forgotten anything or if I'm misrepresenting something. But the, the first, I think, important point that we made was um, to just kind of talk a little bit, what, what do we mean when we say cross-sectoral? What sectors are we actually talking about? And, uh, um, uh, you know, obviously we've kind of been assuming that we're talking about culture and health, um, but even, but that is not necessarily very, a very useful distinction because in many different um, political systems, many different countries, uh, the way that uh, the sectors are organized can be very different. And you can have the social sector together with the health sector, you can have, you have the science sector together with the culture sector, it can be quite complicated. Um, and so I think what, what, what we, we didn't want to get too hung up about that categorization, but the point I think that we, uh, um, we gravitated around is this idea that uh, no matter what sector, no matter what building, no matter how close people are to each other, there tends to be a way of thinking that you could roughly uh, categorize as uh, the kind of culture way of thinking that isn't necessarily always compatible with the science, health, public health way of thinking. And that's the bridge, I think, that we're, um, we're trying to span. Um, the... So the, I think the next question was, so what, what, what actually needs to change? Um, and in answering that question, we realized, so the, the first thing that we realized is everybody, almost everybody, bar one uh, in our group was from the so-called culture sector. So um, we didn't, we, we only had one person in, in our group who, who was um, uh, from you know the other side, as it were, even though that's not a, not a very good uh, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, definitely not that. Um, but uh, um, and I, I think that gave us a bit of pause for self reflection to kind of say, well, clearly this is an issue that we are perceiving more than um, than on the other way around. Maybe that's not so surprising, um, because I guess the people from the culture side are trying to get in on uh, 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 the action as it were in, in, in the, uh, on the health side, but nevertheless, it was, uh, it was something that we, um, that we remarked on. And so 
when we when we kind of asked ourselves what needed to uh, change in this uh, um, in this relationship in order to promote better interaction one thing that we uh, a couple of things kind of became clear um often there are structural challenges in play i mean it might be that people are working in different buildings it might be that people are even working in different cities you know um but it might also be that the, the way people in different sectors work on a day to day today in terms of office hours or or whatever um might be practically um different and, and consequently might hinder um, collaboration on, on some perhaps minor level, but nevertheless uh, um, a level that, that, that is worth recognizing. Um, but fundamentally, I think what, what we gravitated towards is when, when we're asking, so even though there might be these structural challenges, um, at the end of the day, the thing that needs to happen more of is uh, fostering more individual relationships. Um, trying to reach out um, to people rather than thinking of them as systems or as sectors or as these kind of entities which are perhaps a little bit abstract. At the end of the day, all of these systems are um, comprised of people. Um, and if you pick up the phone or, or I guess that's a bit old fashioned, but uh, um, if you you know, set up the Zoom call with uh, with that uh, with that person in the uh, um, uh, in, in in the health sphere. Uh, you're more likely to build a connection, which is actually going to um, potentially somewhere down the road lead to systems change. Um, and I think we 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 talked a little bit about the challenges surrounding that. I mean, uh, um, you do, you only have a limited amount of energy, and uh, you you only have a limited amount of time. And so I think one of the suggestions, one of the wise suggestions was um, try to focus on those people who have an open mind or are potentially already um, kind of interested in, in, in your domain. And uh, um, several people in our group kind of expressed the position that actually that is, it's not that uncommon uh, to, to be accepted as a word, uh, you know, for, for public health people to be interested in what you have to say. I think there, there might still be sometimes this worry that uh, um, you're going to be dismissed out of hand, but in many cases, um, there is actually an open ear already for, um, for the kind of proposals and thoughts that we bring to, um, to the table. But that table is, uh, you, you know, the question around the table also came up. So, the, so um, I think there's a, um, there's a challenge, even though there's interest, there's a challenge of being invited to the table, um, i.e. Um, in that public health setting, you know, at the decision makers uh, table, getting a space at that table is, uh, is sometimes difficult. Um, and so there, there probably isn't a way to change that system systemically, but, um, but sometimes there might be opportunities to bring the table to you. And then I think this is one of this is where we started to get into. So you know what actually can we do individually, and and I think the onus is also on us to remember to include people um, in our meetings, uh, in our conferences, in in the the, the things that, that we control within our sphere of influence. So to make sure that when when we organize a a conference or organize a workshop, that we have representatives from. Um, the public health um, sector that we're we're forcing those conversations to happen. That we have doctors present. That we have uh, um, people from the medical um, sphere, um, as well as obviously um, people representing culture. And that to be really kind of consistently um, making ourselves bring those people into our uh, sphere of uh, uh, of influence. Um, yeah, and then and then the, so I don't know how much time do I have here. I, I, okay, so 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 one one um, last thing that, that that we concluded with, and that, and that's the question about um, you know what at the end of this you, there was a lot of kind of philosophizing and and, and thinking uh, um, uh, strategizing as it were, but at the end of the day, what do we actively do when we when we uh, um, uh, leave tomorrow or even today? Um, and so we did a bit of a round table about like what are the things that the, that um, uh, we can each individually do. We had some some ideas. Um, I'm going to just talk about the, the the thing that I said. Sorry to take the kind of chair's prerogative here, but I think one uh, one thing that I've really um, that I think is is a really good idea um, was from our colleague colleague from EuroHealthNet. This the the the, um, the portal 
um, and the best practice portal. Um, and submitting something to that portal, it's a, it's a very clear cross-sectoral activity. It forces our agenda into uh, the, uh, uh, the minds of the people who are going through that uh, information. Who knows, it might even be successful, fantastic. But even if not, it's a learning experience on our side. Um, and as I say, it brings, uh, it brings this conversation into the heart of, uh, of EU um, public, uh, um, public health conversations. Thank you very, very much, Nils. And I think that that idea of enforcing ourselves into the conversation, actually taking that space and also having it somewhere where we can share methodologies and thoughts and practices and experiences and maybe even highlight some of the learnings that could be transformed into something more sustainable is quite interesting. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Group 1. Wonderful work. Now we will jump to Group 3. Anybody from group three who wants to take the word? Just wait for the microphone, please. Then people can see you. If you come down to me, Good, come down. <laughs> Thank you. And I hope that our group, we had a, like a very, very lively discussion that they, they can, you can help me. Uh, because of course, when we talk, we're talking about lack of strategies, it was about, well, everything in <laughs> culture for health, because, well, that is what is strategy about. So, um, well, I'm, I'm too I'm too old for these boxes to to, to see see. But um, well, you can you can help me. But um, first we were talking about um, well, who should have the strategy and uh, kind of a okay. Yeah, absolutely. Just standing. So here, it's kind then. of a, uh, is it us here or kind of everyone or What's the decision making process and where to find the leadership? And um, well, we didn't have that kind of a so easy answer to this because, um, like our, our um, colleague from Lithuania said, the kind of a goal is to build a strategy together cross sectorally. And the process needs to be organic and uh, open because, as a sector, culture for health is, 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 isn't in that point where we can have a summit together and really write down the strategy. But of course there are locally and nationally and regionally, there are decision-making processes and, and uh, bodies who can do the strategy. But um, uh, what should be in the strategy anyway, it's kind of a, uh, we need to, uh, enhance the evidence part to we, we need, need to release the potential of civil society and have more uh, grassroots initi initiatives. We need to have more political will. We need to raise awareness. Um, and still we have to have kind of um, a lot of uh, partnerships. It's kind of a, there are a lot of resources we lack in order to build a good strategy. But uh, one resource we, we, we do have is building partnerships to get cross-sectoral partnerships. And also to find all the key players, like uh, Leticia mentioned, uh, art school, art schools to find the potential there to, to, uh, to, to make those organic processes to have a strategy when there is a common goal, what we want to achieve and how. And um, well, we were also, also um, uh, we, we discussed about um, accessibility, quality, uh, relevance of our work and responsibility wherever you work with vulnerable people. These all should be included in the strategy. Uh, if we want to be heard uh, 
by by those who work in the social health se sector. Okay, well that's my like brief <laughs> one. But please add if uh, from my group if there was something I I forgot or misunderstood. No, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Now I think I can actually look into the screen and uh, ask Ugne to take over or one of your colleagues in, in group four uh, and present to us what you have discussed and how the discussion developed into something more concrete, please, Ugne. Uh, thank you. Um, we had, we also had a very broad and, and lively you. discussion. Try again. Try Hello? Again. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, it was my computer. Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I was just going to start and then uh, one of my colleagues will take over. But uh, we also had a long and lively discussion. Um, I felt that maybe we were supposed to be more specific, but listening to the other groups, I think we did all right. <laughs> so, uh, Luciana, please. Uh... Hello. I hope you are, uh, uh, you can, uh, you are able to see me and, and hear me. Okay, so I, I am Luciana from Portugal, and it was a pleasure to be with this fantastic group. And uh, well, I'm here to try to, to summarize the, the really interesting discussion we had. So we tried to fill the boxes and, and also to, uh, to try to answer to the questions. Well, and about the, the first question, uh, we think it's really important uh, to start education since very early stage so that uh, this could be more sustainable, uh, this view that we are uh, trying to, to implement. Uh, the education for health care professionals, it's also um, very, it's a key point since, uh, and we discuss about um, the fact that this should be inserted in the curricula of the different uh, different university courses, uh, so that people get aware and not uh, about the benefits of um, uh, of such an approach. Um, another thing that we we thought it could be really important is to have a shared language between uh, the two sectors, between the health uh, sector, the cultural sector, and social. Because uh, sometimes uh, what happened, or uh, it's that people need to feel they are engaged in the same uh, spirit and that they can understand each other. Communication here, it's really a driving force for us to be able to put in place our strategy. Um, what needs to be changed also that it's important to fund the research uh, and the, the, this will enable us to have uh, evidence base uh, that could help us to, uh, um, to convince policymakers also that what we are doing have huge benefits and in all uh, in benefits for both sectors. Uh, one thing that it was key for us is that long-term institutionalization of programs are important. Uh, so that they could overcome the lifespan of the government. One difficulty, because our topic, it was sustainability. So what happens a lot of times is that we have uh, specific uh, projects or specific actions or activities that will die with the end of the project. And uh, so we need, we need to go over that. And we need to go over the strategy that will also be uh, closed to the lifespan of a, a government, because the government change and uh, all the efforts, all the all our um, work that was uh, done to develop uh, a line, it will be um, closed in, in a sense. So um, another thing that was brought up from some of us, it's that we should have attention, uh, a strategic uh, attention on the recovery plan. So our topic should be inserted in the recovery plan so that uh, this will be easily or it will be uh, facilitated 
uh, to have the, the implementation of, the, of this approach. Um, how this, this change will, will come about? So uh, in a sense, we will promote research and, uh, and this will be a value for the, our upcoming uh, activities and, and, and th this will support evidence for what we want to do. Uh, it will be important to uh, promote the joint events in conference between the different ministries. And here we had maybe one, another ministry that could be important, it's the Ministry of Education, because we found that uh, how, um, the education, the train, the formation, uh, it's, it's a key for uh, to, uh, to maintain the su sustainability of our, uh, what we are here uh, defending. Um, we should encourage a new aerobarometer uh, because, um, and uh, we need to prioritize this topic in the, the frame of the existing scheme fundings. And we are talking about of a lot of frameworks, the Erasmus, the Horizon uh, 2020, creative, uh, I mean, there's a lot of frameworks that we need to, that we could be inserted in our view, and this will facilitate the sustainability of our uh, of our work. Um, so I will pass for the next question. So what resources will be needed? This is easy and it's it's difficult at the same time because we will need a lot of resources and evidence based it's key funding for research and funding for the activity implementation. We will need to monitorize and evaluate and we need to have human resources dedicated, full dedicated. It's impossible to do a work with sustainability if we have people that uh, work 5% of their time uh, just uh, taking attention to this. We need full dedication persons and we need from, from, both, uh, from both sectors or even a third, uh, a third uh, sector. Uh, the resources will come from different sectors, the ministries, of course, education, social affairs, health culture, and a lot in, in the different levels. We, we will think that it's very important to the European level, the national level, and also at local level. This needs to be shared between all these uh, dimensions, and, and, and this is the only way that we can promote. Well, I try to summarize everything, but I think maybe my colleagues, if I forgot something and if there's something that it's really important, I, I think you should go ahead, please. I think there was one more, one more slide after this one. Uh, uh, yeah, thank yeah. you. Okay, okay, I was, uh, so who is, uh, will be responsible? I think here we both agree and all agree that it should be a shared responsibility. We need both sectors or all the sectors involved need to feel this is something that belongs to them and their equality and sharing responsibilities. And um, it should be shared between the institutions on different levels, and it should be independent monitoring bodies also. Uh, the overall benefit, uh, it will be, of course, a better sustainability of programs, a better public physical and mental health, and uh, a more cross-sexual collaboration. I think one, one of the things that we, we point out, it was also that it's very important to target the communities because as, as it was said before, uh, the communities or the, even the target population of our, of our programs, sometimes people are not aware enough of the benefits that they, they will have with the, these programs because they are not um, aware uh, how this could help them to be healthier. And uh, so they don't adhere the programs. So we can have, a really good program with really good, really well designed, but if people don't adhere to them, it's impossible to have results and this will not sustain in time. I guess it's uh, any anything else that I should say? I don't want to, I want um, 
to be a good representative of our group and we had such such a great discussion that i don't want to miss anything no i think you did a great job thank you so much that was thank a very you, very good summary thank you yeah thank you fantastic. thank you so to everybody <laughs> Okay, so let's jump on to group five, which is my own group. Um, and I will ask one of my colleagues to do the presentation because you're, you're hearing me, not anybody. Maya, could you, sh could you highlight the uh, second post-it from the left all the way down? Because I think that's the one that we spent most time on. Come down and grab a microphone then. I think you should start. <laughs> okay. Um, so what did we actually talk about? The challenge was inequality. And, and I think we, you just have to scroll your screen a bit, Maya, because <laughs> we can't really see what the first one. Yeah. <laughs> inequality due to society in reality being built by men, but built by all of us. It is a systemic bias. Um, we talked about people not being represented there's all sorts of people that are not being represented in in making decisions talked about power and money and this is not equally distributed among types and we sort of agreed i i think that the major uh, inequality uh, pro the major inequality problem is a gender thing uh, 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 most of society, policy, power, money, buildings, whatever, it's all built by men. And having th there's been put money into this for thousands of years. So everything that's been built has come, especially from 50% 50, 50 of the population. And now uh, new things like cultural activities that, that mostly women are into uh, haven't had the long-term uh, funding that other sorts of things has had or things are built for other types of people. I think, can I just add to that? Because I think it, it's, it, we started off with what is actually the fundamental inequality between the two sectors. And there is something about language there's something about a, a, an unbalance that is in the sense that we design the whole of our society not just these two sectors and that unbalance is about budgets and it's about systems and it's about values which basically underpins a male masculine perspective on who who runs societies and where is it where is it important to be if you are a male structure so if we follow the gender, the gender line and say, do, if we create equality as the opposite to inequality, if we really strive to get equality, we will have to wave in all perspectives. An intersectional approach to society will also help us create more bridges between culture and, and health. So that it, it, it was from that perspective, this, this notion that one of the bricks that we, one of the elephants in the room we rarely talk about is who takes the decisions, what kind of, of structures are actually in the decisive rooms, who are actually running the systems. And that's why the gender conversation became so important in our group. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, but yeah, yeah, so we're, it, it's yeah, very difficult, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. I just want to, to underpin that it's not from today we're starting. It is a very, it, it's something that has, been, it's not from today we're starting this, but it's, oh no, I can't say anything. Sorry. 
yeah um no i don't i don't think the men men take up space at all um <laughs> We did talk a lot about kind of the cyclical nature of barriers and to access and how, you know, programs aren't getting funding because funders are only interested in certain types of programs because the people who are delegating that funding, I mean, they do tend to be, you know, older men, um, but also just kind of <laughs> how those barriers um, kind of continually pop up in all levels of sectors and then of course when sectors combine how those barriers continue and in some ways worsen because when you have issues with access to healthcare and you have issues to access to arts and culture when those two things combine then you have in many ways double the issues of access um, so we talked about ways to make this change come about including um obviously more public support and funding. And then we talked about <laughs> challenges in developing public support, um, which I think we just ended up in, again, in issues of power balance um, and men, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, and how the, these perspectives need to be shifted alongside um, kind of cis overall societal issues which is this was a, I think it was just a really challenging one because it really just ended up bringing us into kind of how inequality in arts and culture is based is rooted primarily in societal inequalities and how kind of society needs to change in order for the sector to be able to grow and change um does that I, I, I just want, would say that you should all have been there uh, because it was such an inspiring, in, inspiring conversation. And I think words like democracy and empathy and curiosity were words that came through the conversation. And if you just think about it, democracy, all people's right to be seen, all people's right to get treatments, all people's right to partake in cultural solutions or cultural experiences or cultural expressions and cultural narratives all people's right to be part of a conversation through curiosity and empathy if, if we could follow that as a threat to build something we might actually be on the right track instead of always having this kind of predefined focus that it has to solve one specific target rather than maybe the potential of the things that we can't really see. So I think it was, for me, it was a very inspiring conversation to be part of. Now, it was very, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of the very interesting things that we talked about, I think, was um, operating in kind of gray spaces, like where we had dinner last night at, I'm gonna butcher it. Institute for X. Institute for X. I knew it had an X in it. <laughs> at Institute for X and kind of, the opportunities that kind of a boundless creativity can have um, for individuals and for a sector as a whole. Um, and one of the things that we kind of bumped up against that again was the struggle to find a balance in power. And our solution was to just have in a dream world, everyone would have, have a board that is representative of the community at large. So people of all ages and ethnic backgrounds and whatnot but I think sadly we're still kind of a ways off from that but it's an it's the idea of kind of working towards that I think and working to make sure that all views are seen and heard in 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 our practice yeah yeah, yeah yeah and the, when discussing policies when discussing everything else we just need to remember that what policies are being accepted well, those are the ones that are being accepted by the ones in power. So we can make all of the policies we want, but we just have to realize that somebody, someone will read those policies and act on them with money or with power. And we can make everything, but we need to, to know what the audience is and how can we shift the perspective of the audience so that and 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 how can we bring up new leaders who are not focused on on getting as much power as possible yeah, more focused on community. 
Oh yeah, and creating leaders that are focused on community rather than their individual. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Great, great, great conversation. Group, not five, but group six. Yeah, come and join me. I have to stand next to you because if I don't, you won't be on the screen. I just want to say that the taxi, we, we have taxi in five o'clock in eight minutes. Okay, we can manage in eight minutes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll make it very brief then. Um, and that's going to be easy because it was a very difficult question that we had. Um, and the question was, sorry, with the... Group you, five. Yeah, six. Could you just... Group six, not five, but six, yeah. Yeah, lack of coordinating policies. In our group, we were uh, luckily represented both by the EU level, by the national level, and by the um, uh, regional level. Yeah, sorry. So we had... A, a lot of, uh, of levels um, there in the same room. Um, in, in, in EU, only a, a very small uh, amount of euros are dedicated to this uh, very important um, uh, area. Uh, on the national level, we all agree, uh, agreed that it was so difficult to get these two um, areas to work together. Um, even in Denmark, where there is a, a big focus on, on, um, on arts and, and uh, health. Um, however, if I was just, uh, if I'm going to make it very brief, I'll just sum up, uh, I think, one of our best recommendations, uh, and it, it's going to be a repetition of what was said earlier by one of our brilliant speakers, is that, um, yeah, uh, it, it's so uh, important to uh, to to uh, remember uh, to talk to the specific uh, level uh, in in uh, a language that they understand i think that was uh, that is our if i were to sum up our discussion that is uh, one of our main takeaways so to to uh, always um, focus on when you're talking to the regional or net or, um, or uh, a local level it's so uh, yeah you have to have that in mind um, yeah, I don't know how else to, to wrap this very uh, intense and uh, also a bit frustrating discussion. But um, yeah, I think that's our main takeaway. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That's a very good recommendation, by the way. Remember to always address your target in the way that they will understand, which is not, that should be logical for all of us, but it isn't always. Group seven. Oh, wow. Exercise. <laughs> you want to say? Yes, thank you. OK, we had the challenge um, uneven awareness. And at first, we were talking about uh, what do we understand about this challenge? And, um, and we talked about, is it uh, geographically uneven awareness, or is it common uneven awareness, or what is it? So uh, we uh, just. Uh, uh, took a chance and uh, got in the, in a way or what to say. <laughs> okay, so uh, some of the things we talked about is that um, um, even in this uh, conference, uh, we don't, when we talk about culture, we talk about health, we don't uh, uh, actually know what we mean. So this uh, definition, we need to get a definition. And it can be a lot of things, as um, we talked about yesterday, you know, the, the different pathways in this uh, policy. That's okay, as long as we know what the definition and the purpose of what we're doing is. So, um, so we, we uh, uh, actually, we were talking about, is it culture and health? Is it culture for health? Is it culture in health? Is it culture is health? Or what is it? Is it culture, is it art? So, uh, so uh, some way we have to make these definitions so we know what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, yes. And how will this change come about? Uh, we have to, for example, uh, now I come from uh, the health sector and um, uh, I'm new in this area, but uh, there's a lot of uh, unmissing uh, definition about health. So we have to... Uh, 
uh, you know, try to dig in the health definition and uh, and try to uh, create an awareness about a holistic definition in health, especially in education, politicians, funding programs, and so on. Uh, and also, when when we have these uh, funding programs, the one who designs them, that they know what kind of definition they are using, so we we can uh, make the the right. Uh, uh, projects or interventions and we we're also talking about for example uh, uh, this about the uh, uh, common you, you talked about this uh, uh, participatory, participatory action research um, maybe try to go some new uh, ways in uh, the research area yeah and uh, how do I switch you know <laughs> Just scroll down. Just scroll down, 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 down. You made 20 yeah. pages. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> so uh, we, we wanted to be, uh, you know, uh, practically, what can we do about this? Uh, we want to, uh, we have to get a coordinated structure, uh, both uh, on a European but also a local level. And um, actually, we talked about a simple campaign. Uh, that uh, tells about this uh, area uh, that we can use in uh, multiple ang languages and uh, in multiple uh, medias and so on, structured by this uh, coordinated um, area. Maybe Culture for Health is this place to coordinate all these things. But also developing educational material for different target groups, for example, uh, um, care uh, takers, uh, uh, practitioners in uh, maybe public schools and so on. Yeah. And uh, um, finally, we talked about this uh, collecting different evaluations tools and uh, make standards because we all, there is a lot of evaluations tools, but we have to make these standards so we can learn from each other and not uh, create uh, new things every time. Yes, I think that's uh, almost, is, is, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah thumbs up, yeah. fantastic, thank you very much. Mafalda and the group, yeah, 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 yeah. Two person, yeah, fantastic. Come and join me. And we don't have much time, so. Sure, you can, yeah? you can. Oh, you can. thank you, perfect, thank you. Thank you, all right, I'll try to be quick because the taxi is waiting, right? So. Uh, Right, our challenge was to uh, identify funding avenues that would be policy-based. However, uh, we found that um, impossible within an hour. So what we did was that we, we discussed a strategy to um, then identify those funding streams. Um, so I have to change it here, right? Yeah. Right, I oh, know, it goes. Your own, but you can change your own. Then, uh, ah, yeah, yeah, it goes, okay, great. Ooh, very, very intelligent, right, thank you. So what specifically needs to be changed? We think that um, the health policy has to change in two main ways. And this echoes, of course, conversations that we had before. One, the focus has to change from illness to health in all dimensions. This includes mental health, it includes social health, et cetera. Um, and also that uh, it should change from treatment to also promotion of quality of life. So that's the what needs to be changed and what these funding avenues aim to achieve. Uh, how will this change come about, though? What kind of what needs to happen? Uh, the healthcare system needs to be open to integrated, integrating other professionals in their work. Artists slash cultural workers must be open to continuing to work in this way. And this is a very important part of the conversation that we had. There's uh, we need to recognize that artistic work can also provide a service to the healthcare system or to society. But uh, as we'll discuss later on. Um, it's a recognition of that potential of uh, artistic work. It's not a demand that all artistic work um, achieves this goal. It's going to follow me again. Yeah, oh, great. What resources will be needed? First, a key point, uh, project-based funding is not enough. Artists, professionals, they bring knowledge, but as we saw this morning, they also bring openness, empathy, and to do so, they need to be at their best as human beings. So they need to have financial security. However, our focus was on funding. What do they need? Holistic rather than a piecemeal approach to funding. Second, we need support as well of training. So not just project-based, but training. For example, the education of health workers to understand the evidence of impact. Three, uh, to create arenas to help um, interested actors gather information. Um, 
information funding, etc., and also supports awareness by uh, spaces of interaction of their potential in this regard. So we need not only funding, but also funding holistic, uh, supporting training, creating uh, arenas of information sharing, and then um, supporting uh, those spaces of interaction, local or bottom up, to deploy their potential. Where will these resources come from? We agree that there should be a multi-leveled approach to maximize impact and take into account differences at many levels, political, artistic, etc. At the EU level, we think that culture and health should be embedded within broader discussions and priorities and issues. So rather than creating a new niche, so we should embed these and show how um, these address the social pillar, etc. Also important though, uh, funding to which local actors can apply. We know that EU programs, even though there is an attempt, of course, to simplify them, very difficult because there's still lots of admin. And so we do need a uh, small scale funding for those bottom up initiatives. Ideally as well, national and regional strategy to maximize ties if possible. And then again, that's an important point from the cultural sector, there is a danger, a recognized danger that there'd be an increased demand uh, added to shrinking budgets. And so um, that's important to say. That is not to say though that the sector would not bring resources. They would bring their skills, their knowledge, etc. And finally, I'm jumping, but it's not going. Ah, there. Who should be responsible for implementation and evaluation? We think that implementation should be a cooperation between artists, government level stakeholders, health actors, community level actors, citizens, and the evaluation by independent bodies, that is uh, research bodies or universities. What is the overall benefit to policymakers? Policymakers um, should uh, understand or be brought to understand that um, culture and health um, collaborations provide solutions to challenges that they already face, right? And that they have multiple benefits. Um, they should also um, understand that uh, co these collaborations help them reach the SDGs. And of course, goal three, but not only. And who are the target audiences and the benefit the society? Um, they are the same for us. Um, uh, the benefit would be that we'd all get healthier lives, more inclusive societies, and if I can add a personal comment, also a more prosperous understanding of societies and of development. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you wow, all. Wow, what a stage. <laughs> Thank you, Natalia. Well, no problem, no problem. Thank you very much. It's my, it's my privilege to be able to wrap up, but I know that the taxi is actually waiting outside. So maybe that wrap up should not be a wrap up, but a wrap in tomorrow morning instead. So instead of me talking now and holding you back, I would just say thank you very much for a fantastic afternoon. Thank you for all your contributions, for all the brilliant reflections that we have shared with each other, for the speakers earlier, for the round table, for the participation, for you who has been with us online, for your patience, for the camera working, for the microphones being uh, able to actually function as well, and for everything that is waiting for us. So thank you very much. See you later at dinner. Those of you who are here, have a nice dinner, those of you who are at home. <laughs> and I'm really looking forward to see you all tomorrow morning as well. So see you later. Thank you very much. Enjoy yourself. Enjoy the evening.